Good evening, everybody. We want to thank uh, those of you that have gotten on tonight. We're going to wait for just a couple of minutes here to give uh, more people the opportunity to click that Zoom link and get in here to join us and let everything launch. So we thank you for being here and just give us uh, just a minute or so and then we will get started. Thanks to everybody again who's on. We have a good crowd tonight. Really appreciate you taking uh, the time this evening to get on. Um, we are gonna give it just another minute here as we give folks more time to click that link and get their Zoom launched and get in here and join us. So uh, just bear with us for one more minute here and then we'll get started. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. We uh, want to thank you for joining us this evening. We are going to do everything we can to keep this to one hour so that we can end at 9 p.m. sharp. There's some sort of uh, other debate going on tonight that some of you might want to watch. Not sure, but, you know, we're going to do our best to get out of here right at 9 o'clock for you. I uh, want to thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Trevor Sutherland. I am the uh, Senior Advisor of FAIR Districts. It's great to have you with us. Uh, to kick us off, I'm going to give it over to our executive director, uh, Tiara Ward. Tiara? Hi, how are, how is everyone out there? Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you tonight. Uh, so what we want to do is give a kind of a brief overview of Fair Districts and who we are and what we've accomplished so far. So about two months ago, um, a group of us, Trevor, a couple of the delegates on this call, realized that um, time was winding down and it was getting really close to election day. And we knew that this uh, amendment did not need it to be passed, but we were like, there is no grassroots organization um, kind of lobbying around the issue and making sure voters know the truth about what this actually does to Virginians. So what we decided to do was um, myself and Trevor, we got together, we got the pack off the ground, and we've just been building a, a really grassroots organization. Um, talking about just reaching out to voters on social media, um, just having conversations around the issues that matter. Back in April, when a poll was done around this issue before we existed, before voters knew what was at risk, um, they were at 60%. Now we are here last week of uh, September, right before October, early voting is currently happening in Virginia. And it's, it's down to 48%. And that's due to our grassroots movement, that's due to the folks on this call having the conversations with voters that matter. And that's just due to us getting to the people through the people. So um, I wanna thank you for taking the time to talk to us um, and hear about what the issues are and kind of learn more information. So we're going to have a panel discussion with the, the four delegates on the screen. As you can see, we have uh, Delegate Aird, we have Delegate Levine, uh, Delegate Price uh, and Delegate Simon. If you guys want to wave and say hello, I'm sure they can see your beautiful faces. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to take some time to talk about the issue and to make sure that people are uh, learning about what's going on. So I would like to first kick it off to Delegate Simon. Tell us how we got here. 
let's say I'm an accomplished Zoom person. I remember to unmute before I started talking. So I'm off to a good start. Um, so uh, I'm Delia Marcus Simon. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I represent the city of Falls Church in Fairfax County here in uh, Fairfax. I've been a member of the General Assembly for about uh, seven years, eight years. Since 2013, I was first elected. Um, and I remember actually when I was first elected going to a forum with League of Women Voters uh, and being very impressed with their position on redistricting, which is that we ought to have nonpartisan independent redistricting because we believe that citizens ought to pick their legislators and not the other way around. I just thought that was such a clear and simple uh, statement you know, about what we thought about redistricting. And I guess what's happened is, and how we get here to 2020, I still believe that. I think we here at Fair District still believe that's the way we ought to be doing the drawing of districts. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what the amendment that's on the ballot uh, for voters to consider starting now and going till November 3rd uh, says. Uh, so how did we get here? Um, the process, you know, over years and years, advocates uh, for redistricting have, have put forward different legislative proposals to change the way we draw districts in Virginia. Uh, we've kind of coalesced around this idea of a citizens commission, right? A nonpartisan, independent commission of experts and scholars and, and thinkers about these things uh, that was representative of the entire Commonwealth of Virginia that represented minority communities and communities of language uh, minorities, other folks that have been victims, frankly, of gerrymandering over, over the generations, uh, give them a seat at the table, give them an opportunity to, to have a voice in drawing the districts uh, and get the politicians out of it. Uh, as that process went on, an organization was founded uh, for the sole purpose, you know, express purpose of doing what I just described, but at, they, they also were really committed uh, for better or for worse, they're really committed to being bipartisan. We do really anything it took to get some Republican support. And what that ended up being, uh, the piece that they needed to do to get some Republican support was they, they basically jettisoned um, the part about giving communities of color a seat at the table and guaranteeing their representation. Uh, they got rid of the idea of making it fully independent um, and keeping legislators out of the process. Uh, and they got to something that by 2019, you could get a very scared group of Republican legislative leaders to support. Why were they scared? Well, because in 2017, the General Assembly went from being, you know, 60 something to 30 something to 51 49, right? And we were within two votes of taking back the, the legislature. So in 2019, you get a bunch of proposals that went into the hopper because this was sort of our last chance. So, real quickly, the, in, the, in Virginia, to change the Constitution, it's difficult. Uh, you know, just like changing the U.S. Constitution is really difficult and why it took so long to pass the ERA. Uh, although we don't have states to ratify, in Virginia we make it difficult by saying General Assembly has to pass it, both houses, uh, then there has to be an election, then a new General Assembly has to pass the exact same words a second time, and even then it doesn't become part of the Constitution until the voters approve it, right? So that's the part of the process where we are now. Well, 2019, we knew was our last chance to pass something before that last intervening election, before redistricting came up. And so a lot of us voted in 2019. It's one of the big questions. Well, Marcus, Mark, a bunch of you, not a lot of Sharice and Price, she to their credit, but a lot of y'all Democrats voted for this thing in 2019. What was going on? Um, and the answer was all this stuff went into the hopper, the good stuff, the bad, and everything went into the sausage making machine, right? There's the legislative process. And on the second to last day of the session, we got presented with this the redistricting bill, right? This is the one that made it through the process. And this is the one that you're gonna to have to either vote for this or you're voting against redistricting reform. That's how it was pitched us, frankly, a lot of the same ways that people are pitching the amendment now. And so if you weren't on p and &E, because I wasn't on p and &E at the time, if you weren't really engrossed in the process, if all you knew was this is your last chance before the election to vote for something that's better than what we've got, you better vote yes, or when you go to the polls, you're going to you know, be in big trouble. You have to answer your constituents. So without really knowing the details, and frankly, I'm embarrassed. I, I'll just say it. I should have listened to Sia. I should have listened to La Charisse. I really should have. Um, but we didn't at the time. Um, and so we got the amendment that we got. But I knew also that we'd have a chance to come back after the election. It wasn't part of the Constitution yet. I'd have a chance to hear their concerns better. We have another look at it. Um, by the end of last session, I had spent so much time with Delegate Price on P&E. Uh, and Delegate Levine as well. We spent so much time together that I, I actually pitched an alternative on the floor of the House of Delegates at our last minute pitch, right? The second to last day of the 2020 session, we said, why are we settling for this, right? We, we had a lot of our colleagues that were uncomfortable, again, voting no on something. So we want to give them something to vote for. So 
the delegate Price and I developed an alternative constitutional amendment that we put in as a floor substitute, which would have had the effect of killing the amendment, but it was give people something to vote for, which would have been all the things that we've talked about. We'll talk about more, but independent redistricting commission, all citizens, representative of the whole Commonwealth, uh, guaranteed seats at the table for historically disadvantaged groups, um, and Republicans voted that down. So um, what ended up passing, we got we got very close, and, and despite the best efforts and really impassioned pleas from Delegate Air, Delegate Price in our caucus, uh, we didn't get all the way there. Uh, but so we, we had this made it through the Senate and the House, and now we've got our last chance to stop it, which is to stop it from being voted in by the voters. And that's what we're about here at Fair Districts, and that's where we are in the process now. And with that, I'm supposed to toss it to whoever's next. De Delegate Ayer, Delegate Ayer. Whom, whom you just were talking about. Hi, good, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm LaCherise Ayer, and I'm really pleased to be able to join you all tonight. You know, Delegate Simon made some really amazing points. Um, first, that beginning in 2019 and 2020, with this amendment, um, I tried along with Delegate Price and many other colleagues to really sound the alarm about the problems uh, with this uh, constitutional amendment that's before us. But prior to even then, I admit that I was one of those individuals that was afraid of not supporting uh, redistricting reform because I wanted to see a reform that was independent and nonpartisan. But unfortunately, that is not what we have before us. You know, in 2019, my district, the 63rd district, was struck down due to racial gerrymandering. And we went through the process as a caucus of trying to develop our own maps. And for me, that was the firmest affirmation that I needed of my position, which is that voters should be choosing their legislators and not the other way around. And that was because, unfortunately, and I can say this as a legislator, we just cannot remove our innate bias of wanting to draw a map that protects our longevity in the legislature. And so specifically, there's a few ways that points to how this process would not be independent and not it would not be nonpartisan. Number one, the commission would be, the amendment would create a 16 member commission of legislators, of citizens selected by legislators with no criteria on the makeup or prescription of how those citizens and what type of citizens would be appointed. These, um, both the legislators and the citizens would be appointed by legislative uh, party leaders. Uh, in addition to that, you would be given legislators even greater power than the citizens on this commission. While you would have possibly 14 citizens who could say, you know, we've gone through the process and I'm in support of a map, it would only take two legislators of the same party to be in disagreement. And I know it's late, but our math is always good. 14 can say, I do, I am in support of, but it only would require two legislators to disagree and it would eliminate the remaining 14 that are in approval and kick the map drawing process over to the Supreme Court. That is compounding the power of eight legislators and more specifically, two legislators that would be in disagreement. In every step that would be taken in this process under this constitutional amendment, legislators would be in control and be involved. From the selection down to the final map, over to kicking it over to a Supreme Court that was selected by Republican elected officials. And the last thing I will say is that supporters of this amendment often refer to the fact that this is a bipartisan, uh, compromise and agreement that was founded. Let's be clear, just because you have party elected officials and leaderships in uh, control of this process and appointed to this commission, that does not make it nonpartisan. Um, that does not make it bipartisan. Um, you are ultimately cementing the power of eight legislators into the constitution and giving them greater power over the citizens on that commission. We have a responsibility to truly fight for redistricting reform. And unfortunately, this amendment is just not it. 
And I'm just going to continue to urge you all night long to not settle for a compromise, not settle for a step in the right direction because we can do so much better. Amazing. Oh, Levine. <laughs> I think I'm scheduled next. Uh, I want to thank Marcus and La Charisse for, for putting that uh, so well. Look, I think when it comes to this question, you just have to ask yourself what you believe in. And there was a time when we were all on the same page. There was a time when we in One Virginia 2021 and Linda Periello, we all said we wanted nonpartisan, citizen commission, independent drawing the lines. And what happened is every time we put forward that proposal, every time One Virginia 2021 put forward that proposal, it was killed. This is back when Republicans controlled the General Assembly. They killed all our reforming proposals. And this was the only thing they could get through. And it was supported by the lead Republican gerrymanderer, uh, it's Mark Cole, and the lead Democratic gerrymanderer, George Barker. And I, I loved George, uh, he, he's, but that, you know, he has a district that is very gerrymandered. So um, all of us supported reform. And I think you have to ask yourself, do you support an independent nonpartisan assistance panel? Or do you support what Delegate Ayer just described, which is what Amendment 1 is, a four-party leader panel? There's 60 people on the panel, the four party leaders, and the other 12 that they choose. And their fellow legislators, they can be spouses, kids, business partners, so forth. And then, of course, that's not the worst of it. It's not only that legislators uh, basically control the whole panel. It's that it's just an advisory committee. Because two legislators kill it. Two senators, two delegates on the panel kill it. And they just throw it away. And all those transparency provisions that many of you like, they go out the window too. The amendment's very clear that once the commission is dead, all the transparency is dead. And it goes directly to the Virginia Supreme Court. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, right? And then some say, well, what's the problem with the Virginia Supreme Court? Well, Virginia is one of two states in the entire United States whose court, his highest court, is chosen entirely by the legislature. That makes us very different from other states that people sometimes cite, California and Iowa and so forth. 48 states have the governor or the public choose the judges, not Virginia. We had the legislature do it. So the current Supreme Court is made up of whoever the Republicans wanted to be on the court. And I remember, I think it was my first year in office, maybe it was my second year, we had Justice Jane Merrim Roush. She was bipartisan. She was supported both by Governor McAuliffe, a Democrat, and by Dave Albo, the Republican chair of uh, the, um, the, the Courts of Justice Committee. And they both thought she was fair and bipartisan. And Republicans said, well, we don't want someone fair and bipartisan. So they fired her and put in Ken Cuccinelli's right-hand man. And I know there's some people here, I know one Virginia 21, people who love Ken Cuccinelli and trust him. I admit, I'm not one of those people. And, 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 and to be clear, I don't trust Mitch McConnell either. So I'm very consistent about that. But he's on there. You've got uh, uh, the sister of a sitting Republican senator. Uh, you have a former Republican senator, Republican delegate. You've got two folks to the right of Scalia. You have basically a six to one Republican panel. And again, it's not like either side gets to, to, to choose, right? Any two senators, any two delegates kill everything. If it's a 14 to two vote, the two beat the 14. So yeah, I'm very concerned about the Supreme Court, but that's not even the worst part. The worst part is the amendment allows gerrymandering. And, and I really think that needs to be repeated. The amendment allows pure partisan political gerrymandering. Senator, uh, Senator Barker admitted that to me at House Privileges Elections Committee. It allows pure gerrymandering. So if the goals were originally independent nonpartisan citizens commission and ban gerrymandering, it fails in both goals. So why are we putting something permanently in the Constitution that fails in the two main goals we wanted to do? And why are we putting something in the Constitution that allows Republicans to only choose the maps, right? It, it's not even, it's bipartisan, but if two Republicans object, it goes to an entirely Republican panel. So we have been criticized, those of us on the no side, saying, you folks want to gerrymander. We know what you're trying to do. You're just trying to sneakily sneak a gerrymander in there. And I say, all you have to do is look at our records. Every single one of us in this room, every delegate in this room, in fact, every single Democratic delegate and every single Democratic Senator, uh, whether they are for or against the amendment now, 
voted for Delegate Sia Price's fantastic bill, HB 1255, which is now law. It's not a bill anymore. It's the law in Virginia. It became law July 1st. And that law says gerrymandering is prohibited. Now, that's really exciting. I believe Virginia is the first state in the history of the United States to have a legislature vote to ban gerrymandering. So that's really exciting. That's what happens if Amendment 1 fails. Now, if Amendment 1 succeeds, Supreme Court establishes the districts and, well, you got to, I guess, trust Ken Cuccinelli. Um, so, um, of course, one of the biggest reasons to oppose it uh, is its failure to include communities of color. And for that, I pass it to my colleague, Delegate Sierra Price. Yes, good evening. Um, I am Delegate Sia Price and I have the uh, amazing opportunity to serve the 95th district, which includes parts of Newport News and Hampton. And I've been in the legislature since 2016. Uh, it's so great to be a part of this event tonight uh, where we are trying to demystify this. And so we're trying to just make sure that you fully and truly understand what's going on. Because what's unfortunate is that there are gerrymandering legislators that said no to independent redistricting. And instead of pressuring them or challenging them, organizations settled for a win at the expense of communities of color. Then the proponents of this amendment are the ones that wrote the explanation language that you're seeing on your ballots in a way that makes it sound like the best thing ever and then have the nerve to tell you to vote your values. <laughs> so that's why we are so adamant about letting you know the consequences of this thing. We do, we want everyone to vote their values and vote their conscience, but we also want you to understand the amendment, its implications and what's not in it. So in addition to everything that you've heard, what's not in this amendment are protections for black and brown communities, nor our mandated inclusion on the commission. So we know that redistricting is how districts are drawn and it directly impacts the composition of the legislative bodies um, and thus it impacts the type of policies that we will get made for the Commonwealth. Um, so as someone who has lived under a gerrymandered map, I speak as a black woman whose vote has not weighed the same as my white counterparts prior to 2019 when the federal courts redrew them. So some say pointing to the 14th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act are enough for protections of communities of color. And I will say, like I have said many times before, the 14th, 15th, and 19th constitutional amendments were in place during Jim Crow. And John Lewis died fighting for the Voting Rights Act to be reauthorized. So it is not sufficient to say that either of those stand alone safely and protect, fully protecting communities like mine. And the judicial decisions from this current Supreme Court have allowed political gerrymandering. Um, so the case that we won that, or that the challengers won that got those districts redrawn, like the 94th, all of that was on the racial gerrymander. But that Supreme Court is about to change. So after 400 years of race-based shenanigans in 2020, we do not need to embrace a constitutional amendment that does not protect communities of color in Trump's America. Acts like packing Black voters into districts and diluting our power causes generations of pent-up frustration at unfair systems and apathy towards a system we know wasn't designed for our inclusion but we have a chance to do it differently. In 2020, we cannot go back to the days where government says, trust me, and then we give it the power to screw us again. A no vote is saying no to a constitutional amendment that leaves out clear prohibitions of racial gerrymandering and leaves out protections of color. Another thing is that this amendment, there's not an assurance of diversity for the commission. So people will point to the current elected officials and say, well, there's diversity. There's sure to be diversity. But when we're thinking about a constitutional amendment, we're not just thinking about 2021. We're thinking about 2031, 2041, 2051. And we should not leave that to chance. The fact that there are zero words in this amendment that say who the legislators or citizens are, not race, gender, age, geography, nothing except for party. That is just not acceptable. And the only other thing that it says about who they are is that the party leaders chose them all. So we could end up with, an, no offense to my colleagues here on <laughs> the chat, 
but we could end up with an all white, all male, all Northern Virginia, all Medicare age commission. And it would be, well, I don't think you guys are Medicare age, but it would be perfectly legal based off this amendment. Like no offense, but nah, like that's not good enough. And lastly, for those that say we can fix it later, let us truly listen to what Delegate Simon said about how an amendment happens. It has to pass through two different general assemblies and then go to the voters. And why would we put an amendment that needs an amendment into our constitution? I have lived long enough to know that the same amount of energy from the yes side right now, this same amount of millions of dollars, including out of state money, money from oil tycoons, is not going to be put up in the same way when it is simply to fix it for protections for communities of color. So for something this important, we need to get it right the first time. Yes, that was absolutely amazing. I couldn't agree more. As a Black woman, I understood and felt every word you said and it's part of the reason why I spend my time doing the work that I do. And I'm sure it's the same reason you do the work that you do. Uh, but it looks like we have a lot of questions from everyone around this amendment. And we want to do our best to shed some light and understanding around what's going on. So Trevor is going to uh, take over for our question and answer part from our audience. Trevor? Yeah, so uh, the... The first question we're going to answer is um, actually from Marianne. Marianne asked uh, about the statistic that Tiara gave in her uh, statements earlier about the 60%, the 48%. What that is, is uh, that polling in April showed support for Amendment 1 at 65%. Uh, in recent polling, um, has shown that has fallen to 48%. So that's what was being referenced, is that support for Amendment 1 has fallen. And that's something that we've seen consistently. The more we talk to people about Amendment 1, the more they've learned about it, the more likely they are to not support it. Uh, next question uh, is from Molly. And Molly asks, I understand a ban on gerrymandering passed last year outside of this amendment that would make gerrymandering illegal. Can you clarify if this amendment fails to pass, will the other already passed legislation, I believe that's 1255, ensure that fair maps are passed in 2021? I could answer that, Trevor. Go for it. All right, so uh, first of all, uh, HB 1255 is fantastic if the amendment fails. I talked about it. It, it's, it doesn't just ban political gerrymandering. It protects communities of color. I think Delegate Price is smiling because it's her bill. Maybe she wants to explain it. You're welcome to. Uh, but it, it, it protects uh, communities of interest. It protects language minorities, not just racial minorities. It's a fantastic thing. The problem is, is that the amendment has no reference to it, right? The amendment, one, clearly allows gerrymandering. In fact, the heart of the amendment says, the a district shall be established by the Supreme Court of Virginia. It doesn't say according to standards. It doesn't say according to law. It just says they can do it. It has no restrictions. So uh, there's quite, remember, the Supreme Court gets to decide its own jurisdiction here, which is already kind of a dangerous conflict of interest anyway. They can say, this says we can establish them, period, and they can. So while it constrains the legislature, it is not at all clear that it constrains the Supreme Court. Furthermore, and because it's in the Constitution that you can gerrymander as much as you want, if Republicans or let's just say non-reformers got in power, they could repeal this provision. So the provision protects us for 2021 if you vote no. But I think all of us would agree that those provisions need to be in our Constitution. And we can get it in there as soon as 2022. So we're protected for this time, for 2021 if you vote no and we can get it in there for 2022 and beyond. But the amendment doesn't do it at all. The amendment, uh, as again, as, as its patron admitted, you can gerrymander as much as you want. And it's also important for folks to understand that if you gerrymander as much as you want, whether it's the commission or the court, no one can stop you. Because the federal courts, the United States Supreme Court ruled in 2019, actually after we passed the first time, before we passed the second time, it's called the Rucho v. Common Cause case, that gerrymandering, political gerrymandering, is just fine. Go forth and do it. 
If you want to have a purple state that's eight to three, one party over another, like North Carolina, you can. The federal courts no longer have jurisdiction. So if the Supreme Court, Ken Cuccinelli's guy and, and uh, you know, Ben Chafin's sister, if, if this, these justices um, gerrymander, you can't go to the governor, you can't go to the legislature, you can't go to any court in Virginia, what are you going to do, sue the Virginia Supreme Court? And you can't go to federal court. In other words, there is no relief, there is no appeal, there is no guardrails. The only way to ensure the guardrails would be to vote no on one. So yeah, Tia, I would love to, to chime in as well because I think even before we get to the Supreme Court, uh, like Delegate Levine said, there are zero words in this amendment um, and maybe somebody can drop the link in the chat in order for people to read the actual amendment if they haven't gotten their ballot. But there are no words in the amendment that end gerrymandering, like at all, zero. Um, it weakly points to some stuff that maybe might. And so one of those things is the bill that I've worked on for the fourth year in a row. Um, to have criteria on how the districts can be drawn, which makes prison political and racial gerrymandering illegal in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, people are like, oh, the Democrats just got in power. They just want to gerrymander. Well, let's talk about values and let's talk about value statements. When I vote, I'm giving you a value statement. Every single Democrat, as was stated, every single Democrat supported House Bill 1255 and every single Republican voted against it. So, and well, let me rephrase that. Every single Democrat voted for it. And after 20 years of actively gerrymandering and killing bills that would prevent gerrymandering, Republicans voted against it. So in true form. So when the amendment simply points outward to a state law, but does not have the words of that state law there, if there's a shift in power and the Republicans get power, they can take that language right out the code. And then all you have in there is something that says state laws or federal laws that because this is literally the only law that deals with gerrymandering in Virginia would then be pointing to nothing. And so you can point outward, but if those things change, then what you're pointing to is something different. And so that's just like us waiting for the, um, reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act or any of these other things, like, like you said, the United States Supreme Court being quite okay with gerrymandering even before this new person gets there. Um, and that's the political gerrymandering. And we have no idea what they will say uh, for racial gerrymandering with the new composition of the courts. So why would you not want that word, no gerrymandering, and laid out in the amendment prior to putting it to, into the Constitution as, a pointing, as opposed to pointing to these things that are outward. Thank you, Delegate. The next question we have, uh, the next question uh, comes from Fran, and Fran asks, uh, why did you not pass the enabling legislation, which would have placed criteria on the citizens on the commission? Wouldn't this have solved the problem of relatives, et cetera? Why not pass enabling legislation uh, currently in the special session? So Trevor, I'll take this one if it's okay. Um, C and I worked on actually enabling legislation just so we we're really clear about this. I just want what, what happened. We, we were prepared. We signed a conference report on the enabling legislation and we sent it over to the Senate. And Senator Barker requested a new set of conferees, because he didn't want to work with us. Uh, he rejected essentially our conference report. Um, and, and the reason was, the reason we don't have a, a enabling legislation is because in that enabling legislation, we wanted to be clear about two things. One, what the rules would be if, we, if the amendment passed and we had a, the, the commission envisioned in the amendment. And two, if it didn't pass, what we, how we would, would draw districts. We would have, if it didn't pass, a all citizens commission composed of people from throughout the Commonwealth that wouldn't be uh, poly, you know, legislators, uh, guaranteed the seat at the table, all the things that we talked about that we wanted. And frankly, I believe that the Senate rejected the enabling legislation because they were afraid of giving the voters the real choice between a, a real genuine citizens commission that we could all have. And again, this would have been voted for, it would have been voted out. We wouldn't have had to do it again later. This would have been 
if the amendment fails, this automatically happens. Uh, but they prefer the narrative we're seeing in the chat. I had to turn it off because the chat, don't look at the chat. It's just going to distract you. Listen to us. But, um, you know, the narrative that the choice is, is, is the amendment or the status quo. And it really is not. And that's the message that I, if I can't, if anything else, it's not a decision between the amendment and going back to having me and Sia draw the lines that we want for ourselves and to the exclusion of everybody else. We've never advocated for that. We've, that's never been our position. It's not our position. And we actually put forward legislation that the Senate rejected in the form of this enabling legislation that would have explained exactly what would have happened if the amendment failed. The senators don't want you to see that legislation because they don't want to give you that choice at the ballot box. That's why we don't have enabling legislation. Thank you, Delegate Simon. Uh, we have uh, two questions from Andrew, one of which uh, we can answer easily, the other of which I don't think we can answer, Andrew, but I'll see. Uh, Andrew asks, one, he wants to know what the DPVA's position is on this amendment. Uh, the DPVA is encouraging a no vote. The state parties convention uh, with around, I want to say, 85 percent of delegates, which there were about 1,600, 1,700 delegates, voted in favor of a no vote. So the DPVA recommends a no vote. And then Andrew asked uh, what Bernie's position would have been. And I, I don't know if Bernie has a position on this. Uh, so in, unless any of our panelists have, have talked to Bernie about it, but I don't. If, if you like Bernie, he would have been with us. He would have been voting no. <laughs> don't like Bernie, he's all for the amendment, I'm sure. <laughs> all right, all right. Still kicking around, Bernie. We love it. Um, next question is from Joanne. And uh, I think this uh, might be a good question for Delegate Levine. Joanne asks, if this amendment fails, what happens? It's a great question, Joanne. Thank you for asking it. Um, there are two important ways to stop gerrymandering. I call it the how and the who. One is how you draw the lines, and the other is who draws the line. How we draw the lines, we're halfway, we're done with that. We've solved that problem. And that's Delegate Sia Price's terrific bill, HB 1255. If the amendment fails, the legislature has very clear guidelines. Everything about protecting communities of color, protecting language minorities, it has to be compact, it has to protect communities of interest. And most importantly, it cannot, when you look at the maps on a statewide basis, unduly favor either political party. That's the part where we ban gerrymandering. People don't want to know what's the definition of gerrymandering. The definition of gerrymandering is designing the districts to favor a political party. And what does 1255 do? It says you can't do that. So if we tried to do that, yeah, then the, the court that I'm worried about would come in and, and slap us on it. Some say, well, what's the difference then between having the Supreme Court draw the districts with no standards and having them tell us to obey our own standards? Well, to ask the question is to answer it, right? If we put four maps and we don't obey our own standards, if we favor a political party, they can be slapped down. But if the Supreme Court can just design them however it wishes with no standards, we fear that they will legally go towards their, their political position. So the how is done, resolved. Vote no on one and we can't gerrymander. But the who still matters. Who draws the lines? So all of us here have said we want independent citizens nonpartisan drawing the lines. We don't want legislators choosing these citizens. We want anyone, we want all of you to be able to apply. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, the amendment I put forward uh, um, allows uh, basically with one Virginia 2021's old proposal that was, that was struck down that allows anyone to apply. But we all agree that that's the way it should be. W Delegate Price put forward another bill, 1256, that does some of that. And um, she tried to water it down even a little to, to appease some of the gerrymanderers. Uh, but unfortunately, well, actually, 54 out of 55 Democrats voted for it in the House. It passed the House. It barely failed in the Senate. 17 out of 21 did it. And it failed because even though 93% of Democrats voted for it, all Republicans voted against it. Why did they vote against a fair commission? Because all of them knew that the amendment gives Republicans uh, a thumb on the scale. It gives them this, this poison pill to go to the Supreme Court. They all knew they could just Todd Gilbert could say, I don't want this with Mark Cole, and they would get Republicans drawing all the districts. So given a choice between a fair plan and a Republican favoring amendment, all of them voted no on the fair plan. But let's say, uh, Joanne asked the question, let's say the amendment fails. Now we come back 
and Republicans will have two very different choices. The amendment's gone. They can't get their thumb on the scales. They can either get the fair districts that 93% of us Democrats support with pure citizens, nonpartisan, or if they don't vote for it, well, you know, we Democrats are gonna pick the people. Which do you think Republicans would prefer? Would they prefer a fair independent citizens panel that all of us have been pushing for for years? Or will they prefer that Democrats alone draw the districts? Again, to ask the question is to answer it. I am confident that in 2021, if this amendment fails, you will get at least 130, I actually think it'll be unanimous, all 140 legislators supporting this panel because Republicans will have nowhere else to go. They won't have this amendment to back them up. And then all of us can finally legislatively support these fair districts in time for 2021. Uh, one last thing we never talk about is Amendment 1 has a terrible time frame. It could lead to primaries being a week before the general elections. It's a mess. This wouldn't do that. If we could design it accurately in 2021, we could get started uh, as soon as our session ends in March. The only thing I will add to what Delegate Levine has said, because I see um, a lot of uh, people ask this question often, is what about the long term? I think it's important to emphasize that we still all agree that we want to see a constitutional amendment, but we want to see a constitutional amendment that includes all of the things we are talking about that are missing today. So he described a lot of what's the immediate action, but I guarantee you that you will also see an attempt to immediately draw up and begin the process of getting a fair and accurate and true redistricting reform and commission in the Constitution um, by resetting that clock and starting again. All right, our next question, uh, and I think Delegate Ayer, this might be a good one for you. Our next question is, can we, can we talk a little bit about um, when we say that the, the commission is not independent, that it is not nonpartisan, what do we, what do we mean by that and what would an independent commission be if one were to be passed in the future? Yeah, this is a great question and it's, it's very simple. It's what you've been hearing all night. Voters should be choosing their legislators and not the other way around. A true independent commission would be one that is made up of citizens and not just uh, as Delegate uh, Price described, Medicaid aged uh, white men. It would be a commission where we are really deliberate about the prescription of who those citizens are from a ethnic and racial standpoint, from a gender standpoint, from a geographic standpoint, from um, you know all of those things that are truly representative of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that's going to ensure that the map drawing process are, is inclusive of the lenses of those different communities of interest uh, and the true representation here in our Commonwealth. And so right now, this amendment does none of that. There is no prescription for the type of representation of even the citizens that will be appointed. And quite frankly, you have legislators involved in every step of the process and with more power uh, controlling the actual process. And so when you think about this idea, this simple idea that voters should be choosing their legislators and legislators being removed out of the process, this amendment does everything but that. It cements permanent power to those legislators that are involved in our constitution, which has been described tonight, cannot be undone and we would be stuck with uh, and based on history forever. And actually just one point on that that I wanna add that Delegate Don Scott points out really well. And that is that imagine being in our seat, being a legislator, and it, a bill comes your way and it's put forward by one of the super legislators, the one of the ones on that registering committee. And Todd Gilbert has a bill and he says, Mark, I want you to pass that bill or I'm gonna make sure that you get your district attached to two of your legislators who live nearby. It actually perverts the process. Even uh, if I cast the vote that, that I believe in, that my constituents believe in, but I might lose my seat because of it, I trust the citizens not to put me in that very difficult situation. I would hate to have to anger a super legislator who could draw me out of my district. Our next question uh, deals with HB 1255 and asks, uh, why does HB 1255 not include provisions for transparency? Delegate Price? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so House Bill 1255 is a criteria bill. And in that it is strictly dealing with the criteria for how the district should be drawn as in what they can and can't look like. Uh, this bill was independent of any commission and was intended to be law uh, for whoever the voters decided should uh, draw these lines. And so transparency wouldn't have been in the criteria bill, but it was in House Bill 1256, and that was the one that started off as the truly independent citizen uh, commission in a sense that, um, oh gosh, we took it to the whole next level. <laughs> it was like, you know, mandated streaming. I mean, like who could be on it, who couldn't be on it? Uh, more than three meetings uh, because there are 8.3, well, at last count, there were 8.3 million Virginians. And so there was like a ton, a ton, a ton of people um, that gave input on, and we also talked with some lawyers that were really on to good government as to what should be in the transparency. So transparency provisions are more aligned with bills that deal with the who. But speaking of transparency, the transparency protections that are in the amendment are really weak. And so it sounds like this big, great thing that we're in a public meeting, but what it doesn't govern, uh, because a lot of it was just not meant to include a lot of the communication between us, but I could call Delegate Levine if he's a commissioner and say, hey, I know you don't live in my area, but let me tell you where the Black neighborhoods are, where the Hispanic neighborhoods are, so that you can chop this up for me quite perfectly. Or it doesn't include, if we should ever get back into uh, the lounge, uh, the conversations that we would have privately amongst each other. So it says that commission meetings should be public and that there are these communications that uh, would count as records. But the parts that it doesn't include as a legislator, I know what the loopholes would be. And that's why I'm asking you not to give me loopholes by taking me from this table and getting an independent commission. So you don't have to worry about whether or not I call Delegate Levine or, or if Delegate Aaron and I were talking about how to swap a racial gerrymander for a political gerrymander. Um, even your favorite legislator has a price. And that's the point that we're trying to make. Uh, and so that transparency is huge, but the transparency in the amendment is not enough should we move forward with the commission. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Andrew. He is uh, referencing uh, something uh, Delegate Levine said earlier regarding uh, passing uh, fair, redistrict fair um, re redistricting in time for 2021 and asking, should, uh, should the amendment fail, will you support, will all of you on the panel support legislation uh, in time to ensure fair redistricting in 2021? Yes, and I'll go farther. If I don't, someone should primary me. <laughs> and I think my colleagues would all agree yes, if you want. Yeah, to. I'm sorry. I'm shaking my head, but I realize I should use my <laughs> words. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think uh, we are on record. Um, you know, if you look at what the bills are that we've proposed that were killed year after year after year, uh, you know, you can really see where our values land and where we'll continue to be. We put House Bill 1255 on ourselves as we are in the majority. And so that really should speak to where we're headed. Uh, next question asked, uh, and I think Delegate Simon, this might be a good one for you to take. It's uh, asking about the way the amendment one says that six of eight legislators and six of eight non-legislators must approve. So they're asking, wouldn't it take three, not two legislators to block uh, the maps. Can you talk about that a little? So actually, yes, because there's there's the exception to the exception to the exception, which is that any two legislators of the same uh, house, right, can mix their maps. And so that actually effectively mixes the whole package. So if, um, suppose that uh, Delegate Levine and I, two you know, white men from Northern Virginia are appointed to the uh, commission, just for the sake of argument, yeah, right, that we're there, uh, the two of us can decide, listen, you know, this actually ends up putting uh, me and Mark too close together. Uh, and it has me in the same district as, as Kathleen Murphy and Rip Sullivan in the same district now. And I promised Kathleen I wouldn't do that to her. And so, hey, Mark, let's just, let's kill this whole thing, right? 
Now, we probably wouldn't do that, uh, but because we don't like the alternative, which is that we then kick it over to the Republican Supreme Court. On the other hand, you know, Delegate Gilbert and Delegate Cole could say to each other, hey, listen, this map looks pretty fair, probably about 53, 47, given the changing demographics of Virginia, given how everything's going, this is probably the best we can get out of this group, or we can demand more, and if they don't give it to us, we'll go kick it over to the Republican Supreme Court. So it's really not even a fair negotiation because we're not on equal, like generally in the negotiation, everybody wants the same thing and everybody suffers if the negotiation falls apart. Uh, and in the case of the way this is set up, we, you know, the fact is, regardless of whether you think the Supreme Court is going to try or not or how hard, the fact is it's just a much bigger risk to the two Democrats in any house to, to blow up the deal than it is for any two Republicans. Because they eh, let's go see what the, the, the Supreme Court has to say. Can't be much worse than this. So just read further uh, about that. It is, it is just two of the same house uh, can, can do it. So it doesn't have to go to the Virginia Supreme Court to get a bad result. I tell people, if someone says to me, give me your wallet or I'll shoot you, uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to shoot you. They may just take your wallet instead. So Todd Gilbert may say, give us 55% favor Republican districts, or we go to our friends on the Supreme Court, and you may just give them 55 or maybe only 53% Republican districts because they have that gun that, that we don't have. To answer the two, three question, it is true that uh, Marcus and I can kill the delegate maps and the Senate maps. Any two delegates, any two senators can kill all the statewide maps. Technically, though, it does take three to kill the congressional maps. So just, just to lay that out there, it'd have to be Ty Gilbert, Mark Cole, and Tommy Norman. Uh, Going to try to answer a couple of questions real quick before we close out here. Um, there is a, a question couple of questions asking specifically about some other members of the General Assembly. A couple of senators, you know, a couple of delegates asking, are they for or against it? And I, I think the thing that, that the panelists would say here is, that's a question you need to ask them. Um, if there's somebody that's for the amendment that's in the General Assembly, you need to ask them why they're for it, and you need to ask them why they're supporting it and, and have them explain that to you. Uh, next question, and this may be our last one, or we may be able to get to one more, is uh, from Colleen asking if, if we can explain what the process would be if the maps got kicked to the court. So, so I guess, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll... The short answer is nobody knows because right. there's no enabling legislation. There's, there's no standards. We do know that if you add up all the time frames, it might be as late as mid-October by the time they get it. So they'll get the case October 20th or so. They'll got a rule maybe in three or four days. They better be quick. And then you'd have people enter a primary around the 25th. You might have a primary election around October 29th and then a general on November 2nd for 100 delegate districts. Honestly, just the time frames alone are a mess. And I guess that's what happens when you, you throw something together on the last day of session. Um, it just really wasn't well thought out. But the time frames are a mess. But as to how they decide, the amendment gives them no, no criteria, right? They can do whatever they want. That's part of the reason why we, we don't want it in there. All right. At this point, I'm going to ask our panelists if, if anybody has any final thoughts you want to chime in with real quick uh, before TR closes us out here because we did tell folks we'd get them out by nine o'clock. I do wanna make sure that everybody knows uh, we will be doing this again on Sunday night. Uh, there is another sign up that'll be posted to social media uh, if you can join us and we'll be back Sunday night at eight o'clock. Any of our panelists wanna, they'll get aired. Okay, I, I always feel like you never end a webinar without a call to action. And I know there's another one coming, but mine is that we have a really, really short window to inform as many people as possible about the truth of this amendment. This amendment has been framed, has been very deliberately uh, coined as the redistricting reform we've all been waiting for. If you are on this call tonight, I ask you to call your family, call your friends, talk to your neighbors about the fact that this is truly not the amendment that they think this actually, this is not the redistricting reform that they think it is and encourage them to vote no. 
we really can get to a place where legislators are not choosing the voters, but we can only do that if this amendment is voted down. So please talk to as many people as possible about voting no on this amendment. Yeah, and I would just say like, this, this is not the position that I was hoping that voters would be in. Um, where there's so much confusion, there's so much contention. Like, I'm sorry, if y'all are talking to me in the chat, it, I just, I had to turn it off. Um, I am not getting a check for being here tonight. <laughs> like, I am not on anything that has a financial gain. I am actually asking for you to take me out of a process where I actually right now, as a member of PE, have a lot of power. And so what we're asking for is for us to not put something that is bad in the constitution, for us to go with a temporary process for 2021 that has legal protections to keep Democrats from gerrymandering, that we have shown that we are for transparency. Delegate Mark Levine started the Transparency Caucus. We are the ones that turned on the cameras for subcommittees. We are the ones that got rid of voice votes. We are the ones that have opened things up wide open. We are the ones that said that we wanted more public meetings than what this amendment is saying. We are the ones that are telling you that this process is not 2011 status quo, but it is a new democratic status quo where gerrymandering is illegal. And so a lot of that chat was just noise and it was just false. But here's what I can tell you. Prior to being a delegate, when I would vote, I would vote for things because I've done my own research. And this was just part of the conversation. You can go listen to the other side. But no matter what, if you can't find the words in the amendment, then it's not there. And secondly, if you can't explain this to your friends and coworkers, then why would we be putting it into the Constitution? This was written in a confusing way on purpose. The explanation was written to make it sound like it was the best thing ever on purpose. And this is a trick. <laughs> so if you feel like you're being tricked or gaslit, it is a trick. And that's why we're asking you to vote no. Uh, and I, I'm, again, if you had questions for me personally, you can reach out to me. Uh, our information is all over, you know, social media and everything. Reach out to us if you had questions, but I'm sorry, I had to get out that chat. Okay, well, with that, um, the debate is starting in about a minute or less. So I will say quickly, we have assembled some of the best and brightest, not necessarily the richest, but we are the most fair group of folks working on behalf of you all. And we need grassroots supporters, both online, on your social media, but most of all, we need donations. Um, the support for that amendment has waned in the few weeks that we have been on the ground sparking a conversation and we can continue to make that support drop bit by bit day by day with your support um, so if you could go to our website it's fairdistrictsva.com um, go to our facebook page it's fair districts as well we need your help boosting all of our content, uh, passing along information, talking to your family and friends. But most of all, we uh, need donations. So if you guys could, um, someone is going to drop the link in the tr chat, Trevor, really fast for people to be able to donate. So click on the link in the chat room and help us in any way you can. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next Sunday. Uh, again, fairdistrictsva.com. Thank you all so much for your time and enjoy the debate. Happy live tweeting. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, good night, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Listening thanks to everybody. CNN. We'll be back Sunday. You know what they're saying.